Welcome to the Evergreen Thumb. I'm your host, Erin Landon, a Washington State University Extension Master Gardener since 2015 and a certified permaculture designer and modern homesteader. I'm here to share up-to-date research-based horticulture and environmental stewardship knowledge to help you grow and manage your garden and to share what the WSU Extension Master Gardener program is all about. WSU Extension Master Gardener volunteers are university-trained community educators who have been cultivating plants, people, and communities since 1973. Are you ready to grow? Let's dig into today's episode. Welcome to episode 10 of The Evergreen Thumb. My guest today is Tim Kohlhoff, but first we need to go over the December gardening calendar. Being December, there's a lot less going on in the garden, of course, so it's going to be kind of a short list. First up for planning is if you plan to purchase a living Christmas tree, be sure you have enough space to plant it in an appropriate location. It is likely going to be a large tree when it's mature. Don't keep living trees inside for more than a week if possible, as indoor heat and low humidity in the winter are very stressful for conifers. And be sure to plant your tree as soon as you're able. Another planning idea is to observe how water moves or doesn't move, if the case may be, and plan how you're going to make changes to manage that water flow. Be sure to take lots of pictures so that you'll remember later what the problem was and how you want to manage it. This is especially a good time to do during heavy rains so that you can see where those drainage problems are. Telling, ditching, and French drains may be short-term solutions, but if you have a serious water condition uh, issue, I recommend considering rain gardens or bioswales as a longer-term solution. In maintenance, you want to check your stored flower bulbs at vegetables and fruits for rot or fungus issues, and then discard anything that is showing signs of rot um, for planting. In Western Washington, it's actually a good time to plant trees and landscape shrubs, uh, provided that the ground is not saturated, um, because digging in that uh, very wet soil can actually damage the soil structure and make it very compacted. But if the gra- if it's not freezing and you have some trees and shrubs that you would like to get into the ground and let them get established before spring, this is a good time to do that. Uh, check for rodent damage around the base of trees and large shrubs. Uh, remove weeds to prevent rodents from using that as hiding places. Uh, rodents may also use mulch around the bases of trees as cover. So avoid mounding mulching materials too high on the tree. Sometimes these are called mulch volcanoes and... If they are too high, they can also cause the bark to rot and uh, compromise uh, the health of the tree. For house plants and indoor gardening, if you bring home poinsettias for the holidays, be sure to protect them from cold. Place them in sunlight, but don't let the leaves touch the cold windows. And be sure to fertilize them with a regular houseplant fertilizer to help maintain their leaf color. Monitor all of your house plants for adequate water and fertilizer. These requirements generally are lowered in the winter, so you won't need to water them as often uh, or as deeply, but they do still require some water. And that pretty much covers it for December. Like I said, it's a pretty short list. So now we will get into our episode with Tim. Tim is here to talk to us today about trees, managing trees and other issues during winter. Tim is the Urban Horticulture Program Coordinator for Washington State University's Extension's Spokane County Office. He has led the local Master Gardener Volunteer Program since 2012. He is an adjunct instructor at Spokane Community College, where he has taught arboriculture and plant problem diagnosis classes. For 10 years, Tim was the arborist at the Kalispell Golf and Country Club. He has been an ISA certified arborist since 2004. Tim, thanks for joining us today. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thanks for having me. All right. So to start off, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your connection with the Master Gardener Program? All right. Well, um, I I feel very lucky because I get to work with Master Gardeners. I started as a volunteer back in the year 2000. And uh, when I first was accepted to the program, I made my family call me master for like a week after I got the letter. And that was exciting. But um, 
then I was really excited to be part of it. And in 2008, uh, I started working part-time just a little bit to try and help organize our, our diagnostic plant clinic. And then in 2012, I got the chance to come to work full-time. So now I'm the, the urban horticulture coordinator for Spokane County, which means that I work with the master gardeners, but also do some stuff with commercial horticulture. Okay, great. So to start off, this is kind of a very specific question, but is winter really the best time to prune fruit trees? Yes, and I'm, I'm learning to say yes, and uh, it depends a little bit on uh, what your objective is for the fruit tree and you know, what kind of pruning you're doing, and also where you are in the state. So um, dormant season pruning is really good. Uh, so that you get the best regrowth from the trees if you prune during the dormant season. And also most of the pests that could take advantage of the the pruning um, are dormant during the dormant season, right? Because there's nothing for them to eat. And so you're avoiding opening up these wounds at the same time that pests are active. So it's a good time to do that. However, if you're in the really cold winter part parts of the state, you just have to be a little bit careful that you're not exp you're not exposing tissue to these sub-zero temperatures that sometimes cause cracking or they'll kill the newly exposed tissue that's supposed to that's live that's supposed to help stop the the wound from from bleeding or start compartmentalizing the wound. So in areas like I'm going to say the the uh, mountains along the the northern edge of the state, um, a lot of our like zone zone four zone five places. Sometimes you have to be careful. You don't want the temperatures to get down into the teens or single digits within a, a week or so after you've pruned to try and prevent that damage. But otherwise, winter is a good time to to do pruning. For me, it's a really good time to to prune because I can see all the branches. Right, the leaves aren't there blocking the view. So uh, I really like to to prune during the winter. Okay. So what about as far as like dead growth or as that, I mean, obviously in, in the winter, you're not going to be able to tell what's live or dead without inspecting every branch. But um, I know personally, I normally cut that off during the growing season just because I can actually see it. Is that the best? Yeah. Yes. So yeah, you're absolutely right. So if you see something dead during the season, there shouldn't be any harm in taking that off. And in some cases, it's an advantage on the east side of the state. Uh, some fruit trees, especially apples and pears, are prone to a, a bacterial disease called fire blight. And sometimes getting that out of the tree, pr pruned and removed from the tree quickly is the name of the game. And so if you're pruning for disease control or disease management during the season, I mean, you don't have to wait to the dormant season. It's a good time to prune. Dormant season is a good time to prune in general, but sometimes you need to prune during the season because there's a disease or that maybe there's a, an insect infestation that you could just kind of prune out and get rid of before it spreads. Or if you're doing really light pruning um, or say there was a, a storm which sometimes happens in the spring and there's some uh, broken branches, you want to address those and not have to wait for the dormant season. So um, yeah, if you're doing light pruning, if you're addressing disease or damage or, or uh, insect infestation, you might prune during the regular growing season and it should be just fine. The only problem you might, if you're doing like really heavy pruning uh, in the middle of the season, sometimes you're opening up the, the tree to some of those diseases, those pests that take advantage of those wounds. But usually um, you're doing that during the dormant season. So I know uh, working with some orchardists, they, uh, they prune a little bit all season long just to kind of manage their trees and make sure nothing is really like a disease isn't really taking hold and doing serious damage. And, and it works really well. Okay. And is it true too that, I mean, pruning like after bud break is going to affect your um, production if it's a fruit tree, because you could be potentially pruning off producing buds? 
Yes. So the with most fruit trees, I'm trying to think of any exceptions. So the 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 standard fruit trees that we grow a lot: apple, pears, cherries, peaches. Um, trying to think of some other ones, but those fruit buds set in the they they set on old wood, meaning that uh, they set the fall before the spring when they bloom and set fruit. So if you're pruning off last year's growth in the early spring or in the in the late winter or early spring, you might be removing some of the flower buds that are going to turn into fruit. However, uh, usually you're not removing so many that it damages your whole crop. You're removing specifically like the 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 potential fruit in one part of the tree, but what's left is going to be higher quality fruit because you're not um, you're you're making the tree put more resources into fewer um, fruit instead of spreading it out over a wider like so you might have a um, hundred really good apples instead of two hundred so so apples if that makes any sense right that makes great sense so. How do I prevent winter damage to shade trees? A great way to prevent winter damage to shade trees is just to be taking care of them all during the year. So keeping your shade tree healthy in areas where you have to water, or if you have a, a species of tree that you have to water regularly, regularly to keep it happy, make sure it's well watered and do that what we call structural pruning. So early in, in a tree's life, if you, if you prune it for the first um, 20 years or so, uh, the research shows that it will be much more resistant to damage for the rest of its life if you get it started growing in the right direction. So you're pruning it to have a strong structure. And that might mean hiring an arborist to come in and do it, or maybe, especially when the tree is smaller, uh, you a uh, homeowner wants to do it themselves and that can actually absolutely uh, be done that's something that a homeowner can do with a little bit of study but if you do that way ahead of time you're going to prevent most of the the really catastrophic damage that can occur from winter storms that's not to say that you you're ever completely safe because we get 70 or or higher 70 mile an hour or higher winds and you know there's no telling what might happen there's always that element of risk but if you're taking care of your tree a little bit all the time then you prevent the really bad issues when when there's a big storm okay so i'm kind of a very case specific and um that just happened here. We our first frost dropped all the way down to twenty five, and all of our trees still have are in full leaf. They you know they never completed the abscission. So, what are the potential risks to those trees for damage with all the foliage still on them? So a very similar thing happened where I'm I'm in Spokane County, and that happened here last year where we had. A beautiful summer and and summer seemed to last all through October. Then we had about three days of fall and then winter and and the leaves didn't get a chance to drop from the trees. And so um, I can say with some experience that uh, we were much more worried than we needed to be. I was pretty sure that with all those leaves on the tree, it was going to snow a lot. And then the snow load was going to going to uh, really damage our trees. And we lucked out in that we didn't have as much snow as we sometimes do. And there wasn't really the level of damage that, that I was expecting. However, when the leaves are still on the trees and when they don't fall off, then it does provide more surface area for snow to collect. And so, and when that happens, then there's a greater chance, you know, more snow collecting, more weight on the branch, and then a greater likelihood of it, of it breaking. It seemed like uh, where we were lucky, we didn't have as much snow as we were expecting. And then it was more damaged. Um, it was lighter damage. So it wasn't whole trees falling apart. It was maybe some, uh, a few branches that were, that were um, weighed down and and broke off the tree. So I'm hoping the same is is the case there that uh, there just isn't 
isn't the level of damage that it seems like there could be. But there is a risk to it. One of the things I did uh, that that I, I think was helpful, I have a Japanese maple that I just love in my front yard. And I went out and I kept kind of shaking it and trying to get the leaves off of it. And over time, I got most of the leaves off. I didn't try to cut all the leaves off because that was impossible. Uh, and it, there's, it was just too big a job. But um, I did shake whatever leaves I could off of it. And then whenever it did snow, I went out and if I was able to, uh, I'd go out and shake the snow off so that uh, when I saw branches starting to bend down, then I could shake the snow off. And and so there wouldn't be that long-term weight pulling on the tree. One thing that, uh, that we did find here that was a little surprising with that sudden cold snap, some of the plants in our gardens, especially the broadleaf evergreens, were just not quite ready for that cold. And so in the spring, we saw a lot of damage to uh, rhododendrons and uh, boxwoods and cherry laurel, which actually wasn't too bad if uh, cherry laurel can be a little invasive. So if it was damaged, it usually popped right back. But we had damage that seemed to come from that cold, that sudden just, it was lows in the 40s and then it was lows in the 20s and that seemed to catch some of the plants off guard so there might be more uh, leaves turning brown during the winter than we're used to okay i have an evergreen magnolia that we just planted so now you have me a little bit worried <laughs> okay oh i'm sorry i hopefully everything will be okay but um uh mulch around the roots to hopefully keep those well insulated and then um and I guess one thing I should I should follow up with or end with is that uh, don't panic. Some of the some of the evergreens that we had over here looked just horrible at the end of winter, and people were really so, okay. Well, I guess I better dig it up. But wait, because a lot of them put out new leaves, and and they might not look their best for a year or two, but but they survived even when it looked like wow, there's nothing left alive there, but, but be patient and, and in, in the spring and let them try to leaf out before making any big decisions. Okay, great. So uh, if we do have winter damage to trees and shrubs, when is the best time to fix it? So it, the first thing, the first priority, I guess, would be safety. So if for some reason there's a branch hanging up in a tree that you know, is over your sidewalk, then you know getting that dealt with right away is important, or as soon as you can, that's important. If it's something that's just uh, a broken branch, the branch fell all the way, so it's clear it's not going to fall on anybody, but there's a, a, a kind of an ugly break left in the tree, um, what I'd recommend is waiting until the worst of winter is over and then addressing it then. So when it's clearly warming up, uh, and it could be any time from, you know, middle of February all the way in some parts of Washington. It might be the end of March or mid-April when it's when we know that winter temperatures are going away. Then that's the time to make those those clean cuts where we're we're getting rid of the jagged, broken cuts that that might have been left. If something is um, one of the examples that just jumped into my mind is uh, so somebody planted a shrub in the fall and with the uh, wind or with snow load, it fell over and its roots were exposed. So the best time to address that is right away. Get the roots back in the ground and cover them up. And if you have to even, you know, maybe even stake down the stake, the plant so it doesn't tip over again because the, the roots exposed to the cold and to the air, they'll dry out and freeze. But if it's lighter damage that uh, isn't, isn't presenting really a, a hazard or a, an inconvenience for anyone, then you can, you can wait until the spring and then do, uh, I'm sorry, I said spring, but I meant late winter uh, when it's warming up and then kind of do your cleanup right then. So it's before bud break in the spring, but after the worst of the the cold winter temperatures are are finished. Okay. So, how can we protect trees and shrubs from warm spells that you get in the late winter that 
um, you know, they'll maybe start to bud out or leaf out if you have a nice unseasonably warm week or something. Mm -hmm. And then it goes, temperatures drop again. Is there anything we can do to make sure that they do actually bloom or produce fruit? So there isn't a lot that we can do. We can, we can, I tend to, to be a little bit of a worrier and I'll see, say the magnolia buds start to, to look bigger or, um, or I guess, uh, fruit trees, especially you'll start to see the buds swell and you think, Oh no, it's too soon. Go back. And they don't ever listen to me like they should. Uh, cause I just want the best for them, but it's really hard to, we can't really, uh, do anything to stop that. Usually the uh, plants are, um, I don't want to anthropomorphize them too much and say that they know what they're doing. Usually they will start to, to move forward. And then if the temperatures get cold again, they'll kind of stop in place. Uh, and hopefully it won't, there won't be too much damage. In the orchard areas of the state or the fruit growing areas of the state where there are a lot of orchards, they do have some some things that they try to do so they for one they cite the orchards where there isn't a lot of cold temperature but then in some places they do things like they have big fans that uh, look like airplane airplane propellers that push the air through the site not really practical for a homeowner um, i don't i don't have access to a giant uh, fan sometimes what people have done even even uh, folks in in orchards if it's really if the weather predicts a really low temperature that might wipe out that fruit crop um, they'll actually spray water on the buds and hope that ice forms around the buds and ice will protect the fruit buds from the potentially even lower temperatures it's kind of a there can be some damage to the fruit buds or to the flower buds from the ice itself. And so it's not something you want. It's not your first like, oh, it's going to get a little cold. I'm going to go do this. It's, oh my gosh, you know, I see that these buds have started to to swell. They're open and, and maybe opening up. I'm going to try this as sort of a last ditch. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and protect him because I don't want to lose everything for the tree this year. And I'm afraid if I don't do this, that, you know, the crop will be lost. Yeah, actually, that's interesting you mentioned that because it occurs to me, we have a, uh, a warehouse or nursery not far from us, and they actually do that with their seedlings um, oh, to really? protect their seedlings from the low temperatures. So I could, yes, I can see. And it's so counterintuitive, right? I mean, you wouldn't think, well, I'm trying to protect it from cold. Why would I try and make ice on these buds? Ice is cold, but, but uh, ice gets to a certain temperature and then it, it protects from even lower temperatures. And, and so it really does work to do that, even though, gosh, you know, I, I just wouldn't think that putting freezing water on something is going to protect it from freezing. Right. So what about like with sun scald, similar scenario, you know, where it warms up and then the sap starts moving and you get little, I guess, little blisters or fissures in the, in the bark of the tree. Um, I know some people like to paint the south side of the trunks. Is there, are there other things that you can do to protect trees? Yeah, from cold? I think, I think, and I, um, I know that, so a lot of folks do like to paint the south side of the tree. I'm, uh, and if you, if you dilute the paint, sometimes that works, but I, I guess one of the things that might work better is uh, making sure that when your tree goes into into the dormant season. So at the end of end of summer, end of fall probably is a better time. Make sure that it has a lot of water in it uh, because the more hydrated the plant is, the more resistant it is to that. Now in some places, it, um, that a plant can have lots of water in a tree or a shrub can be really well hydrated and that can still happen. And um, one of the things that you can, you can do to try and protect trees from that. Um, if you're pruning a tree and you're doing a lot of pruning work that's going to expose the trunk of the tree to the, the sun and, and, and to the cold, 
in a way that it hasn't been before. So say I'm, I'm taking some of the lowest limbs off of my, my tree or lowest branches. I might wait until later, late in the winter or even the early spring to do that pruning so that it's still protected during the worst part of the winter. And then in the spring, when it's not going to get quite so cold, I'll, I'll make that cut or those cuts. And then it's okay. Then we can, uh, then the temperatures aren't going to vary quite as wildly. It can still happen, but it's less likely to. And especially if I'm doing both of those, if I'm making sure the tree has lots of water in at the end of the season, and then I'm holding off on that pruning until later, then hopefully I'm giving it its best chance. And then one last thing that I've seen some research on, but I'm not sure that it's, it's, uh, it's not a settled question. But there appears to be a link between planting trees and shrubs too low in the soil, especially trees, too low in the soil. In other words, burying that, that root flare at the base of the tree and that type of sun scald on the trunk. And so planting the, the tree correctly is a way that you can reduce the risk of that, I think. Again, it's not settled science, but we, we think that there's a connection there. And so planting it at the right height and then hydration. And, and uh, if you're removing any of the branches that shade the trunk or protect the trunk, wait until later in the season to do that. And hopefully those three things can, can kind of reduce the risk uh, to the point that it's not an issue. Winter watering. Do trees or shrubs really need to be watered in the winter? I mean, I know they tend to use a little less water um, in the winter, but what's a, is there a rule of thumb? So on the uh, in the cold winter areas, so I'll start with where with what I know. Um, at a certain point, our soil usually freezes solid, and so we could water if we wanted to, but the the roots can't absorb the the frozen water in the soil. So if you're in an area where the soil really freezes, the best you can do is water as long as you can in the fall and hope the plants take it up and then they should be good to go. Plants do lose water during the winter, especially evergreens, because they've they've got those leaves that are still prone to losing water even when it's really cold out. And so um in areas like where I live, it's more about getting water in the ground early and then hoping that they're well hydrated and they're not going to run out of water during the winter season. Usually, we don't have to water during the winter. I want to say usually because there are just so many different types of weather than, than have than we've experienced before. And I know sometimes we get a, a pineapple express in February and all of a sudden it's really warm and, uh, or we get lots of wind, which tends to pull moisture out of plants. And so it's possible that watering during the winter season could be an advantage, could help the plant, but in general, they shouldn't need it. And whatever's in the ground, especially in those areas of the state where maybe the soil doesn't freeze solid, whatever's in the ground that's still accessible to them should be able to replace the amount of water that they're losing. So hopefully we don't need to do supplemental watering. Now I'm saying that and I'm already picturing a whole bunch of people typing in comments saying, well, I, somebody told me I needed to water my whatever it was during the winter. And if somebody specifically said that, if you've had an experience where watering was really important to your plant, that might supersede my, my general rules. I don't use, I don't tell people to water in the winter unless for some, there's some unusual circumstance that's, that says, Hey, this, uh, the soil is not frozen. So the water could actually get to the roots of the plant and we're having some unusual weather pattern, or it's a new plant I just installed last fall. I'm worried about it getting enough water to live through the its first season. But in general, um, I I try as much as I can to just let nature be nature. So, what kind of pests or diseases are a concern in the winter? One of the the um, more common pests that we've seen in our plant clinic the last few winters, uh, there's something called giant conifer aphid. 
and they can be active when it's really cold outside and and also um, they tend to be found on like the name suggests on conifers and what conifer do some of us bring inside during the winter and and decorate in a nice warm area um, Christmas trees we have uh, for those folks who have uh, fresh cut Christmas trees sometimes they'll bring the tree in they'll have it decorated it's just wonderful and all of a sudden it's crawling with with aphids and the the christmas packages under the tree are are getting honeydew dripped on them and it's just a terrible mess and just in the last few years i we seem to have had more people asking us about those in a, in our plant clinic in december and so even though the tree itself right it's it's uh dead it's going to be discarded the the insects themselves are more of a problem for us because nobody really needs um, yeah uh, six legged Santa's elves right they're they're not bringing present they're not doing us any good so this there is a this insect giant conifer aphid that's particularly one that's um, that's a problem there are a few diseases out there that sometimes do well where it's kind of borderline freezing and so we'll see. Um, Pseudomonas twig blight will sometimes take advantage of cold temperatures and it will uh, maybe infect a plant that's been wounded by cold damage, but we won't see it until the plant starts to grow in the spring. And so there isn't really a way to to know that it's happening, but we sometimes, um, where we see this a lot on is on Japanese maples, where sometimes... Uh, it's just as simple as uh, a twig or a little branch gets broken uh, in a storm or s the weight of snow is on it. And so there's a, an opening. Actually, because it's bacteria, it doesn't even need a wound. It could probably get in through the little pores in the bark. And then once it's in there, um, if it successfully infects the plant, then it can start growing at, I guess we'd call it the bookend season where it's it's really starting to warm up but it's still cool and that's where that bacteria seems to do really well and seems to it will kill a lot of the ends of of branches and sometimes spread to the to the slightly larger like the three or four year old branches and so you sometimes get this dieback that looks for all the world like winter damage but it's actually this bacterial disease and you only see that if you have a microscope or if you happen to see the particular signs of, of that. There are a few pests out there that take advantage of the, the cool weather. Thankfully, most of them are a little more like us. And when it's cold, we, we tend to hibernate and they tend to hibernate. And fingers crossed, there isn't some new pest or disease that I'm, that I'm totally missing. Okay. So with the conifer aphids, are those endemic to this area or is it something that's brought in on imported trees? So I think they are, um, we find them here. They can be out in the, out in the woods. They can be on our ornamental trees. Uh, we have some, some subalpine fir trees in outside of our office here in Spokane. And one year I saw them appear on those trees. I don't know if they showed up because of the samples that people were bringing into us. But we also see them out in the woods and we see them in um, Christmas tree plantations a lot. And so a lot of them, because we prune Christmas trees for really dense foliage, then that's that's ideal for those insects. And so it may be more of an issue in those in those areas where they're highly cultivated trees. And in the woods, a uh, giant conifer aphid probably wouldn't do much damage the tree might not even notice that they're there and they might even attract some beneficial insects that stick around to eat other insects but it's the the denser foliage and then the sudden warmth of coming into the house that suddenly the aphids are wow it's spring already i i set my alarm clock for march and it's only december but they uh get right into action because there's Apparently, there's good eating on those on those Christmas trees. Yeah, well, that's why I ask. I live in an area where there's a lot of of Christmas tree farms, and so, like I said, they, you know the warehouse or seedling farm. I mean, that's what they sell are the fir trees for Christmas tree farms and stuff. So, 
the good news is that they're not like in the field, they wouldn't be that hard to treat. And it might not even, I mean, it wouldn't necessarily need a really, what we think of as a harsh chemical or a, a conventional pesticide. There are some products that could be used that that wouldn't have any re- residual or wouldn't be an issue for us bringing the tree into the house. It's, uh, it's just a matter of knowing, oh, I need to do this. You know, we as a nursery owner, I might not see that they're in there because, gosh, how many times do I go digging through the branches of my Christmas tree all the way to the trunk where they might be hiding? So uh, it might be more a question of just not knowing that they're there. And um, then, like I said, I think there are products out there. I know there are some products out there that are are not that harmful, so they wouldn't be um, of a concern. Now I have a couple of questions about erosion and with the, okay. especially like on our side of the mountains, um, we get real heavy fall rains. Yeah. And um, so what are some short-term solutions for erosion um, since it's not really a good time to plant? <laughs> right. Well, and it, yeah, so it, it depends a lot on how much time you have and the, how severe the the issue might be. Uh So it can be as simple as, so some people who are thinking way ahead, um, if the, if the environment is right, one of the things that, that people will do for some, some quick erosion control is planting native grass seed if they can. And that's not an answer for everything because a lot of places there's too much shade for grass seed to really take hold and to to uh, root in the way that is really going to provide us maximum erosion control. But that's one thing that, that people can do. And I always you know, look for native grasses um, and because there are grasses uh, native to different parts of Washington. And there are some that are also marketed for their, their root system because they provide more erosion control. So just, just be careful when you're purchase. If you are purchasing grass seed, look for something that's either native or is, is not going to be invasive and you're not causing a bigger problem down the road. So that's kind of short term. And then over time, you might vary the, the kind of roots, root systems that are in this area. And so you might plant, in addition to grasses, there might be some shrubs, there might be trees. So you're getting different levels of roots. So you're getting some that are a little bit deeper, some that are fairly surface root, and it's all uh, combining to hold the soil in place. Sometimes we don't have time to wait for all of that. And so there are some some other ways of trying to prevent erosion that... Um, that are quicker, but maybe take more money. And I, I hesitate to mention anything too expensive because nobody has any extra money just sitting around that, you know, like, oh, what am I going to do with all these, this stack of hundred dollar bills? Um, nobody has that, but there are um, things that you can do like uh, there's, there's a type of, they call them erosion blankets that's made out of a kind of like burlap or different kinds of organic matter that you can install in an area that um, if done correctly, it's going to limit how much of the soil will erode. Now, before I get too far into this, I should also say, usually where there's erosion, there might be wetlands at the bottom of the slope. And it's really important uh, to work or to be aware of the regulations about Um, working around wetlands and allowable sedimentation or allowable erosion rates. And so um, consult with the Department of Ecology if you have an area that you're really concerned about. That said, um, there are some things that homeowners can do, like the planting of seeds and some some kind of basic um, trying to reduce erosion by placing different kinds of like landscape rock. For those who have a really serious problem, it might be a question of hiring someone to come in and do the work. And then there's a, there's a process that they might put in an erosion blanket. And then under that, some kind of looks like gravel and then what we call riprap, which is loose rock. And all of that kind of weights down the soil and holds it in place. So that's a much more involved and highly engineered solution. And whenever I say the term highly engineered, I, I hear the cash register dinging in the background because I'm old enough to remember what they used to sound like. But uh, there are some, like I said, some things that a homeowner can do 
that hopefully will limit how much erosion might happen and at least reduce it enough or buy enough time that if it's a really serious problem, then they can consult with someone else, consult with a professional and have them come in because erosion is uh, its a really serious issue for anybody potentially who, who lives on or near a slope. And so you want to, as much as possible, do the work ahead of time and not be trying to clean up after an event if possible. So if that's, if you're thinking to yourself, hmm, that slope, you know, down to the creek, I wonder if I should do something. You don't have to wonder. You should start thinking or planning for it now because it's a lot, lot better when you work ahead of time than when you're trying to catch up. So if you're adding trees and shrubs to a slope for erosion control for long term, are there particular species or, or families that are better, you know, that have a denser root system or, you know, are best for erosion? So there are, uh, and there's a, um, there are some lists out there online and it kind of, it depends a little bit on where you are. So what kind of trees, shrubs, grasses, or, or perennials do well in your area? Because obviously you want something that's going to live and thrive in your particular area and under the conditions that, that already exist. So is it, is it really sandy soil, then something that tolerates sandy soil? Or is it, is it highly organic soil, so something that, that, is, uh, that thrives there? Um, so there are different, there are lots of different plants out there. One of the things that I learned when I was researching this a while ago was that rather than, than recommending sp- uh, certain species, it's more important to have a mix of rooting depths and so those grasses for close to the surface and those trees that are a little bit deeper uh, and a mix of species is better than thinking, well, um, there was an old, uh, not research-based idea in eastern Washington that what I want to do is to stabilize my slope is put junipers on it. And it turns out juniper could be one part of erosion control, but just a whole slope of junipers, there isn't anything about that species that really that really protects. In fact, uh, when I was doing some research, I even saw this kind of, it, no one was hurt, but there was a kind of horrifying video from Japan where they had planted a lot of cryptomeria, which is a beautiful conifer and native. They had planted uh, cryptomeria on this slope above a, a roadway. And over time, the, the cryptomeria had really grown together and, and it worked really well until a severe storm. And then there's this video of watching this whole hillside slide down the mountain because the cryptomeria were all kind of of the same rooting depth. And so everything slid together. And it was, uh, even though I was watching on a video screen, I got a little bit dizzy watching this hillside move together because it, it was uh, just, like I said, a little bit horrifying. But the lesson from that was don't do monoculture, try and plant a variety of things. If there's any way you can do, uh, if you can mix a variety of natives that are already growing in the area, that's, that's going to work better than, say, trying to pick out five or six or, or one or two species and, and over-relying on that. That makes a lot of sense. Well, that's about all the questions I have. Is there anything else you'd like to add about trees or shrubs or winter? Uh, I wish that, well, I was going to say, go trees, go shrubs. Eh, winter, you know, meh, I guess on that. But uh, no, I I think um, for people who do a lot of ornamental gardening, don't forget the winter landscape. There's a lot of beauty out there. And even though I, I may not uh, be totally taking my own advice, get out there in the winter and enjoy nature because there's a lot to see out there and there's a lot to enjoy. And um, yes, it it might be a little bit more subtle beauty, but, uh, but think about winter when you're, you're planting your garden or your landscape and, and plant lots of trees and shrubs because uh, they give a lot of benefit to the garden and to the landscape. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. You bet. It was my pleasure. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Evergreen Thumb, brought to you by the WSU Extension Master Gardener Program volunteers 
and sponsored by the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State. We hope that today's discussion has inspired and equipped you with valuable insights to nurture your garden. The Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State is a nonprofit organization whose primary purpose is to provide unifying support and advocacy for WSU Extension Master Gardener programs throughout Washington State. To support the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State, visit www.mastergardenerfoundation.org forward slash donate. Whether you're an experienced Master Gardener or just starting out, the WSU Extension Master Gardener program is here to support you every step of the way. WSU Extension Master Gardeners empower and sustain diverse communities with relevant, unbiased, research-based horticulture education. Reach out to your local WSU Extension office to connect with Master Gardeners and tap into a wealth of resources that can help you achieve gardening success. To learn more about the program or how to become a Master Gardener, visit mastergardener.wsu.edu forward slash get hyphen involved. If you enjoyed today's episode and want to stay connected with us, be sure to subscribe to future episodes filled with expert tips, fascinating stories, and practical advice. Don't forget to leave a review and share it with fellow gardeners to spread the joy of gardening. Questions or comments to be addressed in future episodes can be sent to hello at theevergreenthumb.org. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed by guests of this podcast are their own and do not imply endorsement by Washington State University or the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State. Mm-hmm.